How did a young man from a small city in Massachusetts graduate with a degree in chemical engineering in the 1950s? No one in his family had ever been to college. He had learning disabilities and there was no money for college. Yet in 1957, my father graduated with a degree in chemical engineering from the University of Massachusetts. How did he overcome these barriers? One factor was his love for chemistry. In this video, you'll hear my father talk about how he was experimenting with explosives, flamethrowers, and rockets, and how this led to a degree in chemical engineering. I hope you enjoy this video. My becoming a chemical engineer was rooted probably in the two aspects when I was growing up, uh, Donnie Femier, Kenny Colonna, and a few others of us got interested in building rockets. And we would take a cardboard tube, put a string around the end, and run that string back and forth to form a nozzle in the tube which had been wetted and when it dried we were left with a tapering shape of the tube and we would vary that shape and the location of the taper. In other words, we were experimenting with trying to get thrust from our, uh, we'll, we'll call it gunpowder ingredients. The, it worked pretty well and later when I saw a movie about called October Sky about some high school kids building rockets but they were later and they were, we were solid propellant and they were liquid propellant but it was sort of the same thing that we were way ahead of what was going on uh, in our kids of our age. With that rocket development, it was different propellants were used with different ingredients because we could get different colors from the flames. Particularly when we got away from the rocket development and into the mortar development and we would take a copper tubing about well, half inch in diameter or an inch, you know, it must have been about an inch in diameter. We would drill a hole about three inches from the bottom of the tube and we would pour propellant down the tube and put some cotton wobbing on there and put a piece of Jet X fuse which came from model airplane rocket engines. And we would then take a CO2 cartridge which was a, a steel or aluminum type of tube which was about three inches tall and about three quarters of an inch in diameter, maybe more. And when they were exhausted, the CO2 cartridge, they'd be a hole in the neck of the tube. And we would pour gunpowder or other explosive powders which we were experimenting with into the this CO2 cartridge tube and put a piece of jet X fuse in there and then wrap tape around it, a lo much longer fuse than the one that went into the copper tube. So you had a two-person operation. One person would light 
the long fuse in the CO2 cartridge, drop it down the tube, and the other person would light the short fuse, and you'd both back away, and the short fuse would set off the charge in the long copper to blow the CO2 cartridge, sometimes about 100, 150 feet up, and it would explode, and there'd be different colors. Uh, I think it was strontium was a greenish color, uh, sodium had a yellowish uh, glow to it, and it was fooling around with all those chemical ingredients that when I was in high school that I did well in chemistry because I recognized in the chemistry test you had to memorize the valences of the chemical compounds and for some reason, everybody was memorizing the one, two, or three, or four numbers that went with different compounds, plus or minus. And I found that that was kind of a waste of time and memory because most, probably 50%, were minus or plus two. So I went and memorized the ones and the threes and the fours and didn't try to memorize the twos. I just knew if I didn't know, couldn't remember what it was, I assumed it was a two because I hadn't tried to memorize it. And I was doing very well on the chemical tests and other people were struggling. They were asking me how come I was doing so well, and I told them my trick, which it sort of came to me that part of my character, I didn't have the smartest brains in the class, but I usually seem to find aspects of learning that help me to overcome some of the learning disabilities I had. The only area that failed me was in English grammar because I couldn't, there were no tricks I could learn. But I, and just and going in high school and college, I seem to do things differently than other people. Like in the chemical engineering class uh, of advanced heat transfer, we had the instructor said, we're going to have an open book test. Well, I showed up with about five or six books, laid them out with my regular text, and the instructor came over and looked at it and said, when I said open book, I didn't mean all these reference books being open, but I'll let you do it because you've got them all indexed with paper slips and marking the different formulas and things like that. So you probably put more effort into studying for the test than others, so I'll let you do that. And I passed the test fine. But it was no one else had a single extra book. I was the only one. And here I had five of them uh, all laid out because I interpreted the rules differently than other people did. So that sort of became the way I've done things in life in general. 
I seem to find crutches, we'll call it, to try to overcome any weaknesses I have. And other people may not have that problem, but on the other hand, they don't seem to do unorthodox ways of dealing with issues. Ed? Um, you, you also talked about um, explosive, making some kind of, other than mortars, other kind of explosives and... and yeah, you when I got, when I was in college, during my freshman year, some of the students were pledging to fraternities, and people I hear hardly knew that we were building rockets and mortars even when I was in college. In fact, one of the rockets went up and the nozzle thing wasn't quite right because it didn't give continuous thrust and it arched over into a field and when it landed it exploded in the high grass and at that moment a police car the campus police car was coming up the hill beside that field and he saw us and was starting to drive towards us but when the rocket exploded it started a fire so he stopped to go back and put out the fire while we all ran into the upper floors of the dorms. We didn't go to our regular rooms in case they they recognized some of us or, or the R the RAs I guess you call them uh, might have been watching and said, "Oh yeah, they they're down on the first floor." Well, we didn't go to our rooms, but we we got away with it, but. The reputation seems to have gotten around that I was making explosives because one of them or two of them came to me and said that the, they had pledged a fraternity and the brothers there, as was sort of typical in that time period, were harassing the new pledges and they wanted to scare the brothers off and they asked me to make something for them. Well, I did. <laughs> it wasn't all too successful, but it accomplished what I wanted or what they wanted because what happened was rather than totally exploding, it was pretty big. The ends blew out and it became a two giant flares and it it scared the people off uh, and they thanked me later for uh, avoiding getting harassed. Uh, it was a different time. <laughs> Earlier I was speaking of not quite that uh, explosive. I almost got in trouble with flamethrowers because we were building them too, which was sort of a, a takeoff of the chemical stuff because we were using pressurized cans with bottles and containers of kerosene, shooting out the kerosene over a flame and uh, there was a, and I think I've told this story before, that there was an abandoned house in the middle of Framingham Junction where we lived. And some re stupid reason, coming home on the bus from school, we got talking about the flamethrowers and the experimenting with them in a nearby sand pit. And I said, well, maybe we should torch the building, test our flamethrowers. Well, about a week later, it was Halloween, and all of a sudden that house was on fire. We were nearby in the sand pit experimenting with flamethrowers. 
and we came, we heard the fire engines, and we came up, and my pants smelled of kerosene, which was also kind of stupid. But mm -hmm. some of the other people there, students, you did it, you did it, you said you were going to do it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do it, and I figured it was someone in the group who was really trying to stick it to to us, because there were some, yeah. uh, I had mentioned some Bancroft boys, neighbors, that I had stopped hanging around with, and they could have done it. Uh, but the, I got home, and to clarify to my father, I said, you know, the, the old home down there at the, in the junction, someone set it on fire, but it wasn't us. And uh, he said, you mean the one at the intersection of Katichuit and Beacon Street? And I said, yeah. He says, oh, that's too bad. I used to sell vegetables and fruit. That was an old store. And that's, it looked like a house, but it was really a, a sort of a, a grocery store with a house shape to it. And he said he had fond memories of selling stuff there. And I said, good grief, if we had been blamed or got back that I had done that, burned it, which we didn't, that 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 may have been a real negative for me with relationship to my father. That building, the the wooden floor was gone, the doors were gone, the windows were gone, the roof was there, the walls were up, and it sat on st stones, like a foot of stone under the corners of the building. It was, about as big as our living room here, a little bigger. And we didn't know what it was, uh, but shooting your mouth off that you're going to... You learned a lesson, do, hopefully. You, yeah, you hmm. can get yourself in trouble. Well, you, you, some good things came out of all this experimenting. You met some historic figures. Oh, yeah. The What happened was when we were building the rockets, that at one point Goddard was at a nearby university, relatively nearby in Worcester, at Clark University, and he was considered almost the father of liquid rocket propulsion. He was referred to as Looney Goddard because a lot of his experiments blew up which I can appreciate that, that, uh, but in any event, he had died, but the university decided to have, to set up a, because rockets then now, this is 15 years, maybe 20 years after he, his rocket experiments, we decided to do an exhibit and featured Goddard, who was dead now, but his, we invited his wife to be the honored guest for the, and have a, uh, an opening of the exhibit on Goddard. His wife had some contacts due to his reputation and all of a sudden we found out that Werner von Braun was coming to the exhibit. So we quickly asked him to be sort of like a, make a speech about the influence of Goddard on him. Well, with von Braun, he made his speech. I got a chance to meet him and just talk to him a little bit 
about our rocket, mm -hmm. things with the paper tubes and strings, and he thought that was interesting <laughs> and funny. But, but that was my meeting a prominent person, because he went on to lead the U.S. Uh, rocket. Uh, like NASA, didn't he lead NASA? Yeah, I mean, in his time thing, he was the top scientist. <laughs>